Yes, uh, yeah, glad to be back. Um, I, uh, I actually did my first talk at BrewCon uh, eight years ago. So yeah, um, welcome. So uh, maybe quick intro, who am I? I'm Marcus Vervier. Um, I would call myself a security generalist, so I'm not, let's say, specialized in certain topic, I don't know, hardcore Windows kernel exploitation or, or something. But I am uh, interested in many things, uh, did many things um, from high level to low level. And yeah, in my daily work, I'm uh, responsible for, yeah, for um, two companies, offensive small companies, PSI, based in Belgium, and X41 uh, in uh, Germany. And yeah, my main occupation is managing things there and uh, doing some code review. Um, but sometimes I also can do some research um, uh, still, and um, that's also what I'm going to present today. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about eSIM. So um, eSIMs, yeah, new technology um, found in all modern phones. But the question is, how uh, did I end up with eSIM? And actually, it was spawned because I was, we were talking internally about red team tooling, and it's actually about C2. And the old question, does the world need another C2? And naturally, no, um, at least not if it's just a variation. And I don't know, we ask ourselves, like, everybody's using, like, the same sort of underlying transport, right? So IP, different variations, obfuscation, and so forth. But still, right, it's all mostly uh, same, same kind of, of communication. And a while later, I get, got a phone with an e, with eSIM, and it was actually super easy to deploy, like uh, scan something, install it, done. And I thought, like, wait, isn't that kind of useful for offensive operations, right? So, um, and um, yeah, so started a bit with C2, yet another one. Um, but the interesting thing with eSIM for me, for offensive, was that it's a kind of out of band, standalone communication, right? So, um, um, yeah, you can use SMS, you have your own mobile data connection, and um, yeah, so I started investigating that technology. And main question is, of course, what permissions are required to deploy it on the device? Uh, what, what is it to use it? Um, and, and who and how do they actually implement eSIM, right? So I found a lot of topics to research. Um, yeah, from the profile provisioning, from how it's done on the operating system, from the EU ICC, which is the hardware running the eSIMs, um, everything. So complete overload, uh, everything, everywhere, like all at once. Um, so uh, found like a large zoo of stuff. Um, yeah, and actually I had a bit of previous knowledge because as I said, I had been at BrewCon 2015 and I actually presented something that I would call is a sort of eSIM because I basically um, patched a baseband uh, to virtualize the SIM card. So I could basically proxy the SIM card over some network connection and um, over the internet, for example, and have a kind of virtual SIM, right? It's, I called it shadow SIM back then. If you want to look it up, um, um, there's still a GitHub repo, I guess. So um, yeah, just as a kind of context. So um, topics for today, um, eSIM. Um, I won't say bear with me. Um, I won't go into the nitty gritty details of like how all the protocols are done because that's A, super boring and B, would take like two days, I guess, because yeah, you will see later, it's super complex. But I wanna, wanna see like how does the eSIM actually work on a technical level or a conceptual level and what's the tech surface that it brings, right? So, um, and yeah, of course, as I said, how can it be used for offensive uh, operations? Yeah? Um, yeah, that's actually a talk in the CCC camp, I think from Harald Wendel, who explains a lot about yeah, how the protocols and stuff are, also work. Um, so, okay, high level overview, eSIM. Last 30 years, you had a SIM card, which was like um, a piece of hardware, uh, kind of tamper resistance, and that holds the secret keys for the mobile network, authentication, integrity, and so forth, right? And um, the EUICC, Embedded Universal Integrated Circuit Card, is basically also a kind of SIM card, but it, it can hold like multiple SIM profiles. And a profile is a kind of, I would call it a virtual version of a SIM, classic SIM, right? 
Um, and it can be swapped and you can have, and have multiple ones. And um, yeah, it's flexible. It um, allows uh, you to change the network carriers without flag, um, changing the physical cards. And uh, you don't need a card slot. You can even embed it in also in, the, in watches and small devices. Um, the security concerns are mostly the same as for a SIM card. Uh, prevent fraud, uh, yeah, uh, cloning, protect the unauthorized access, data privacy. Um, there's an additional one that now we also need to protect the, the provisioning of the actual SIM cards, right? Um, and um, that's actually also an interesting point because a lot of complexity comes with that. Um, we look at the um, consumer version of eSIMs, there's also machine to machine or IoT versions. The consumer versions, they allow the consumer to basically sign up with different carriers uh, while the others are more controlled by one. So, um, small schematic of uh, how the EUICC and the smart card layout. Um, I mean, there's an operating system, of course, and then there's several trust domains or um, security domains. Uh, and some of, some of them are basically the actual SIM profiles. These are the ISDPs, um, and they should be isolated from each other. And then there's also um, a specialized, special security do domains uh, that hold secret keys, that uh, provision the um, um, EU ICCs. And interesting, they can talk to the outside world also, and for example, have end-to-end -end encry encrypted communication with some backend. Right? Um, so quite complex already, and here you see all the, pro the protocols. Um, yeah, there are hundreds of pages. Um, so, short recap, so basically virtual equivalent of a physical SIM card, uh, multiple profiles, and you can switch dynamically and remote provisioning. So how actually are the eSIMs provisioned? There are multiple, multiple ways. Um, one is you can pull the operator's download server sort of, and they can be sort of auto-deployed based on the EID, which is a unique ID of the EUICC. Or the user can get an activation code or scan a QR code, or there's a programmatic way to store, um, yeah, a, a store application, for example, in Windows mobile plans. We will see later. Um, yeah, this is, for example, a QR code to, um, that you get to install an eSIM. And um, inside is an activation code, and the activation code uh, basically uh, gets also translated, or basically it's this one, so where to actually get the eSIM profile from, right? So you scan that, that QR code, and um, if you scan that QR code, you can basically install, um, install the profile on your device. And yeah, of course, there's an ECC ID, MC, and so forth. Um, on Windows is actually interesting. I looked into that a bit, and they started supporting like mobile devices and connectivity out of the box. And yeah, they have a mobile plans app or One Connect, it was called before, and they have like special capabilities for eSIM. And also, yeah, apps can install or operator apps can install that. The interesting thing is that you do not need to be admin on the on Windows 10 or, or 11 uh, by default to uh, install an eSIM. So yeah, now we have the situation adversaries, what I wanted so to get out of band network access potentially, but we, yeah, we covered that later. Um, quick overview, so Windows, there's similar different services, um, a stack, there's a local profile assistant, there's the W1 service, MBB driver in the bottom, so this is like the low level, and um, of course then some uh, communication with the internet from this service. Um, I can quickly show actually how an eSIM can be acquired or also, interestingly, what's the tech surface there, right? How you get an eSIM on Windows and um, is this now making things, I don't know, more secure or less secure? So if we go, so um, everything's integrated. This machine has like a, a LTE modem. And you can see here, yes, yeah, it's a cellular modem, and then there's the UBG. I already have an eSIM there, but um, yeah, maybe I, I didn't top it up. So um, you can basically click in the network menu on connect with the data plan, 
and it will then open uh, this Windows um, Mobile Plans app, which is yeah, pre-installed on Windows. And it has like some um, operators that have contracts with Microsoft, and they, um, yeah, they provide connectivity, so you can go there and get an eSIM or top of an eSIM. So here, um, yeah, it's UBG, so we can click on get connectivity um, to um, yeah, go to the operator, and then we, yeah, we get some, some uh, yeah, login or can create an account. So if I click on login, um, yeah, there's some guy that comes that uh, I don't know, probably doesn't work for Microsoft or Maybe he does and reviews the patches or something. It's not, it's highly likely. Um, so, no, <laughs> what, what, happened, what happened here? Uh, basically, um, this mobile plans app in the light of modern development is using a web view to render the UI. And um, the web view actually yeah, gets the content from the web and it gets it from uh, the operator's site. It's basically a store website. And, um, yeah, there's a predefined list of allowed operator sites. And since it's a web, any vulnerability on, uh, on one of these sites uh, leads to uh, yeah, bad things. And I could, for example, inject content here. Um, I cannot tell too many details here, but the, um, um, yeah, here, that's a vulnerability. If you are a network man in the middle, you can basically take that over. But um, there's probably other things that I couldn't investigate since, yeah, cannot do unauthorized testing. But um, yeah, so now we have basically our content here. And we could, of course, run a phishing attack using Morena, reverse proxy to get the credentials, present a phishing site. Uh, you can also try to, um, I don't know, get RCE or maybe run a more simple phishing attack, try to open an application, and I mean, the user here is, um, the user is, um, of course, I guess, trusting it because you cannot see that it's a web website, right? So, um, yeah, I can pretend, for example, to uh, pop calc. Um, yeah, this is a phishing scenario, but I guess every month there's another way to execute code on that. So, um, what does it mean? It's not an e problem of the eSIM itself, but it's a problem of the attack surface. So now we have like a Windows mobile plans app that, uh, I don't know, if somebody hacks one of these 20 sites uh, of the operators, then um, they can yeah, compromise or attack uh, the users um, of, uh, <laughs> of this mobile plans uh, app, which of course is something we don't want. Um, and yeah, so there, that's one way to attack sort of a system with e -team. Um Okay, but how actually does the profile provisioning work, right? So we've seen, okay, you can buy something, but um, what is actually your profile? And um, the production UICCs, they are bootstrapped, so the, 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 the hardware is bootstrapped with GSMA signed certificates. So, um, and if you want to install a profile, you need to contact the so-called SMDP plus um, subscription manager data preparation address, which is some server on the internet that is um, also certified by the GSMA, and that one has a, like encrypted MTLS connection um, and uh, can remotely manage the SIM card, um, the si profiles on the on the card on the local card, right? Um, the problem is that it's end-to-end -end encrypted also for the user and you cannot really see what's inside. And the profile can have applications and so forth, which is, I don't know, kind of bad for researchers, I find. Um, so you don't actually know what's deployed on your phone. And um, yeah, if you got the money, you can become an operator or get certified. Uh, but what about like a single researcher, right? We cannot really, I don't know, play around with profiles and so forth, or can we? So. Uh, I won't explain all the details here, uh, but this is sort of how it works. Um, so there's like the SMDP plus, there's the device, and then there's the actual EUICC card. Um, 
and the end user interacting with the device, and it's, this is like the end-to-end -end channel. So the device can also not look into what is deployed from the operator side. Um, so the SIM, eSIM profiles are isolated via these security domains, the ISDPs, and they only exist on the card in the, this context. And the domains can have different privileges, uh, so this ISDR, for example, can manage these, right? Um, the problem is actually that, at least for me, it seemed to be quite secure from the design level, so they did a lot of work to make sure not, that nobody uh, create some fraud scenarios. So, I mean, bugs have been found in smart cards before, but the overall isolation is, yeah, enforced quite tightly. So, um, I didn't find a new bug in the time I had. Um, yeah, and the isolation worked quite well. Yeah. There's another schematics, um, so the keys are also managed by another domain, and um, yeah, how it works with the communication. Um, yeah, SMDP Plus is an um, HTTPS server. Um, it's actually not, it has like a special uh, CA back, uh, and uh, so it's from the GSM Association. You can actually find that on the internet. Um, um, and on the other side, on the card, is in a special security domain. Um, so it's actually two layers of security. So there's the CA preloaded for the TLS. MTLS, and then there's also an additional layer of encryption uh, which encrypts the actual payload. So even if you break the TLS, then their profiles are still encrypted, right? And yeah, to summarize that, um, they use actually proper algorithms. Um, I did not find any obvious logic bug because I was thinking like, haha, yeah, probably they they didn't uh, do that correctly or something, but um, yeah, no, actually breaking, breaking that, I assume take some implementation bugs, um, but nothing at the time. So yeah, I guess that's it, case closed, and yeah, thank you for your time. Um, uh, we cannot do much, no. <laughs> um, I mean, the question is, what do we actually want to achieve? Do we want to break some encryption, or do we want to actually, I don't know, get access to the device or to the profiles? And um, I, w I like to, do this more in red team scenarios where I say like, I have a goal and I want to reach that goal. So what's the goal here, right? So what's the goal? So we can set some goals and then see, despite this secure provisioning, I don't know, can we get control of a device? Can we get control of a profile? And um, um, since they are widely deployed, yeah, we also want to use it, right? So it's not only about breaking, the encryption or breaking the deployment, but we also want to use them, right? Maybe can we use it in a legitimate way? Um, yes, and um, um, I used the Lenovo Fibocom and Lenovo machine for that, um, and the motivation originally also was to, um, um, to actually use it as a C2 and because the EDRs might not monitor, right? So if you're a defender, um, maybe look at eSIMs because they can be a nice vector to hide uh, traffic. Um, so we set some goals. E eSIM as a smart card, it's a kind of HSM and like most security te technology, it can, it's like um, dual use, right? So you can use that maliciously or to protect something. And um, if we are an attacker, we can set some goals. I set a goal, I wanna deploy my own profile, right? Even though I'm not, let's say, a operator. I wanna also install custom apps because the profiles can also have Java apps, we will see later uh, in a demo. And also, yeah, maybe I wanna find some vulnerabilities like the one I showed before, which was, I guess, quite simple thing, but there could also be other things. And of course, we wanna create some nice tools. So. Actually, deploying your own profile is quite easy. Uh, <laughs> it's quite lame, but um, uh, you, uh, you can also just pay for deploying at least one test profile. That's actually not that expensive. And uh, why the test profile is so interesting, we will see uh, soon. 
Um, of course, you could also try to break uh, hardware with hardware attacks. Um, that would actually be a potentially catastrophic scenario because it looks a bit like that the different batches of, or models of EUICCs might share the same keys. Um, I can't say, but um, it was hinted at that. They can revoke them, but they talked about revoking them for a whole class of devices. So it might potentially be catastrophic if somebody can extract one of these keys or certain, um, from um, the actual EU ICC. Um, but okay, now, actually paying for custom profiles, um, that's not really cheap, but for a test profile it's a bit cheaper. And um, there you cannot just run your own production SMDP, but you can use another one. And you also have to deal with a lot of ASN1 magic and so forth. Um, but yeah, test profiles exist. Uh, this is actually how a test pro or this profile looks like. It's defined in um, ASN1 uh, with a header and a body, and it can also have applets and secret keys. And I guess also the operators have some other stuff in there that they don't want you to see, right? Um, we can actually deploy a generic test profile. Um, this is how it looks like. You can also do that um, on, uh, on Windows, similar to the store app. You can deploy sort of custom, um, custom profiles via the network settings again. Um, so if you have a QR code or if you have a, a activation code, and what I did is I basically went to one of the backend providers and um, paid yeah, a bit of money, but not too much. Uh, it's for still bearable to actually um, be able to install my own test profile that's provided by the uh, GSMA. Yes, um, so that's what, um, how I I did that, I mean, you basically, that's, you see the activation code, and um, then we'll contact the SMDP on the internet, find the profile, and install it, um, install it on my device. I actually speed that up a bit, um, and then the different, there can be multiple profiles, um, to, and then you can use it. Now, the thing is that uh, this profile, of course, is a test profile, so it doesn't connect to any real network. However, the good thing about the test profile is that we exactly know what's in it, and it also, we also know, like, uh, what are, like, the, for example, the secret keys, right? Um, and, um, um, since we know the keys, we also know the OTA management keys and the admin keys. We don't know all the keys for the EU ICC, but we know all the keys for this um, eSIM profile. And um, that's actually quite of interest, uh, interesting. So we managed to deploy our own profile. So the next thing is, since we know the keys, now we can actually deploy some custom apps to, um, the, um, to the eSIM profile. And um, that means, for example, that we could um, install SIM toolkit apps, for example. Um, or we could um, create our own base station, which for legal reasons I couldn't test um, uh, easily uh, because I didn't have that set up, and uh, have the eSIM connect to our test network because the keys are like 112233 and so forth, right? So, um, so yeah. Um, um, also, in the process, a uh, quick side uh, track, uh, we found that depending on the content and uh, the, so forth, uh, this Windows Local Profile Assistance Service um, might also have some bugs. I actually don't really investigate Microsoft bugs anymore, but uh, um, uh, if anybody wants to investigate that, uh, yeah, it's um, basically, um, yeah, there, there's some, some crashes that can be found, right? So um, that's depending on what you do there with the different profiles. Um, uh, bad things happen, like this one, right? Where you get like some access violation. Uh, but that's just a, a kind of side quest um, that uh, yeah, I found. Um, but still, back to the custom apps. So um, in the 
previous research, um, we um, there there was on classical sims there was a lot of research done uh, for um, sim toolkits apps and so forth. Um, uh, the thing is that it always built down to having malicious operators that would install, that have the keys that, that could install stuff on your phone, right? Um, or, of course, attackers able to crack these over-the-air keys. Uh, they used to use DAS, but nowadays they're using AES or triple DAS, so that's a bit more secure. However, if you have now this test profile, then you know the keys, right? And you can install it on production devices. And um, that, of course, changed a bit this, uh, the, the threat uh, lan uh, landscape because if an attacker can install the eSIM profile, even the test profile, they can also OTA install some apps, right? So, uh, quick question, did anybody uh, install that uh, activation code that I showed before? <laughs> okay, uh, should I uninstall it for you? Or <laughs> so. <laughs> So, no, um, don't worry, at least I would not uh, do anything, um, but um, the problem is that uh, this, it has default keys and they are, yeah, like uh, one 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 and they can actually, for example, using SMS, uh, you could, um, yeah, install uh, apps and, uh, I don't know, trigger other things on the phone. Um, that's, um, of course, um, uh, probably not something that you want, but on the other hand, for a researcher like me, now I found a way to run my own SIM toolkit stuff uh, e more easily, right, without, I don't know, creating my own SIM card or um, buying, like, test cards, right? Um, so, um, how does the app provisioning actually work? So, there's GSMA remote provisioning, it's a global standard that was quite complicated, so I didn't look too deeply into it. Um, there's global platform, if you can talk to the SIM card. Um, um, yeah, it's also widely used, and then there's some proprietary message from card vendors. And yeah, um, another way is to, um, of course, use SMS and SMS PP. So um, yeah, if we, as I said, so if we have the keys, um, uh, they can be used. Uh, there's a global platform. They're called KeyAng, KeyMac, KeyDeck. Um, and um, there's a, another problem that these keys could potentially be cracked. Um, but I, yeah, that's, that's maybe a different thing about smart cards. Um, so um, the, the biggest problem with installing your own apps is actually that SIM toolkit is like completely hell because uh, all the tools are super old and um, writing this application was a bigger challenge than installing a custom applet. Um, but the custom applets, there's actually no really good open source software, but there's one, um, it's kind of proprietary from SIM Alliance and somehow they try to have the feeling they try to hide that application nowadays for some reason. But basically, it can, um, it uses the SMS um, um, way to install it. It can also talk directly to the card, that's what I do here. So, um, you actually see here, this is one of the default keys, 0001 and so forth. So, this is always the same if you install the, this profile. And yeah, they use triple DAS, um, uh, so, um, and yeah, and uh, the applets running on the card are Java Java applets. Now you can see it now that it deployed a new applet on that card, and uh, in a short while we will see what it actually means if uh, the applet is deployed and and run. So we have a kind of demo applet that can be deployed. But this is basically you could also do that over SMS if you uh, can send SMS to the to the victim. Um, yes. So, um, why is it interesting for us to install custom applets on, on a SIM card? Um, think about mobile phones like Android, App Store, um, iOS App Store, right? They are very tightly controlled, so you cannot really install, custom, especially on iOS, you cannot install custom apps 
just like that. I mean, in developer, uh, for developers maybe, um, but or jailbroken devices, and they tightly control that. But interesting thing is that the SIM, um, these apps, they are like, complete, the SIM card apps, they are sort of out of control completely. Of course, there are some APIs, and they are kind of limited, but the SIM card apps are completely out of control from, uh, from Apple or, or, or Google. They only can control what the SIM card is allowed to do, but some of the things they have to allow. And um, some, sometimes they don't adhere to the specifications, probably for security reasons. For example, um, the spec says that you should be able to open the browser from, uh, from the SIM card. So the SIM card should be able to open the browser and uh, load some website, which is something that I think at least modern iOS and Android phones forbid, uh, orders not so much. Um, yes, and um, um, the Java can, applets, they can be installed on, yeah, the most EU ICCs, they have a Java runtime, so you can use Java to write these cards, and on the card you find packages, instances in the applet, uh, so it's, yeah, that's technicalities. Um, uh, this is how such an applet looks like, so that's the Hello World applet, so it's, it looks kind of easy to write. The problem is finding the right compiler, so the card uh, JVM is actually accepting the bytecode, right? Uh, but yeah, you can, you can write that, and you can say like, hey, I want to actually have a menu and a pop-up or something saying Hello World. So, um, and um, yeah, now coming back to our goals, we can deploy our custom apps to the EU ICC. So we can deploy some profile, we can deploy apps to the EU ICC, so we have an eSIM profile. Uh, let's say in a red team scenario, we could hack some system and install our custom stuff there, and it's in a separated environment. Um, yeah, finding some vulnerabilities, also we did that uh, a bit, at least in the implementations. Uh, question is, what can we actually do, right? And uh, one, let's say, uh, conceptual uh, thing for C2 would, of course, be we have some kind of implant on the system. It can talk to the SIM card. The SIM card can talk to the outside world with the mobile device. And, for example, we could use SMS as a C2 or something else, right? So the adversary could, could like, have a known out-of-band C2 channel. So what's the... Yeah, what's the, what's the offensive potential of that, right? We, um, we tested SIM cards, um, we um, got the OTA keys, and uh, yeah, physical hardware is difficult, but actually uh, if you want to, for example, test um, EU ICC that's soldered into a system, and you're not, as me, not as good with hardware, I can do it in software now, right? I can, I can provide some profile, run some apps, and do some nice tests. Um, also against the mobile device. And the custom profile enables like security testing yeah, without hardware skills, uh, right? Lim in a limited way at least. Um, there's also with the app some phishing potential um, like we can show because we can also display stuff on devices, right? We can display stuff um, with our apps and uh, we can also send and receive SMS and display forms and how that looks like, um, I can actually um, show in a minute. And um, yeah, there's an API for these apps called, for example, Simple Toolkit, and there's also USAT, it's a more modern version. And um, it can um, issue some commands uh, like display text, refresh stuff, profile download complete to the mobile device. Yeah, launch browser doesn't work on recent devices anymore. At least I didn't get it to work. Maybe someone else has an idea to, to reactivate it. Um, yes. Um, um, there's one interesting thing is that the mobile device, the SIM card cannot just at will send the command to the mobile device. It needs to be polled. So um, how they, what they did then is they basically have special responses that say if the mobile device is sending a command to the SIM card, that they say like, hey, I have another command, please uh, pull me. And um, that makes the communication kind of slow. Um, and also broken APDUs, these are the commands are like filtered. Um, but um, if we want to, for example, use a fuzzer, yeah, then we have no coverage implementation. 
but it's a very easy way, for example, to, yeah, I don't know, just try to send random commands to the mobile device. Um, yes. Um, how does such a command look like? Um, I think this is iOS 16.3, so it's a bit outdated, but um, it should still work. So what you see here, enter your passcode, right? So let me maybe go back quickly. So what you see here is, um, it's like an iPhone and it's locked, but um, um, this dialogue that you see here is actually not the system dialogue. It looks a bit weird, right? It's actually an overlay coming from the SIM card. So you can, um, and the, the input also goes to the SIM card. So the SIM card can sort of fish you for your passcode, um, which is, I guess, kind of bad. Uh, <laughs> So especially since uh, these dialogues have like priority over all other dialogues, even over system dialogues, right? So um, this app, um, you can actually start that. It's a, a little fuzzing app, fuzzer app that we, uh, we wrote. Um, so um, you can find it, yeah, it's in German, sorry, the, the menu, but it's basically the mo mobile network settings. So you go to the SIM applications, and here I called it Fire and it's just issuing random commands, right? Actually, it can make the phone unusable um, because you cannot get rid of these dialogues, right? So if I install a malicious eSIM profile on your phone, I could sort of break your phone, and actually I never tried if a complete factory reset of an iPhone would get rid of it because potentially the EUICC is a separate chip so I don't actually know if it will reset itself, um, pro potentially. So, but yeah, so that's, that's basically the potential if you are able to deploy the test profile and have some custom app on, on that system. Um, another thing, maybe a quick showcase, what can you do with eSIMs uh, out of band C2? Um, that's actually written by a colleague of mine, Nicolas Laleas. Um, and um, the scenario here is, of course, you uh, have like maybe temporary code execution uh, access and code execution on some system, let's say in a red team engagement, and uh, either physical or with some payload, and you cannot rely on the internet to be available, right? I guess in the bad guy scenario, the ransomware gang has, I don't know, access in the system. Um, the defenders are pulling the network plug um, to try to uh, prevent them from I don't know, issuing commands and doing bad stuff. Um, so the solution for us as the good guys showing the problems and for the bad guys, of course, is that we bring our own network connectivity or we bring our own out-of-band channel, right? And um, we developed a small tool that's also public. It's called SMS Shell. Um, and what you can see here is a machine on the right that doesn't have any internet connection. Uh, you have to believe us. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it runs some kind of agent from the SMS shell, which is using, um, using the SIM card, and the yeah, network connectivity can be deployed with an eSIM. And then on the left, you see the back end, the C2 controller, and we can just send uh, commands that are encoded over SMS. Uh, it's super slow, yes, but fast enough, right? And you can see like, who am I? You can like uh, issue commands, get back the responses. Um, the only thing you have to be careful, I think we have enemies now at Mobile Vikings because we uh, used some Mobile Vikings uh, uh, SIM cards to test that and then we got an email that we should stop messing with, uh, <laughs> with SMS. I think they have maybe capacity problems or something, so I guess they, they were not really seeing what we were doing, but they were seeing that we sent a, a lot of SMS back and forth, and I think their systems uh, don't like that. Uh, sorry if anybody's here, so it was not on purpose. <laughs> so, um, yes. So, we could, of course, also create a next level implant, sort of. Um, that's not in the PUC. Um, so um, uh, that actually runs mostly on the, um, on the eSIM card or on the, on the EYCC. And uh, because, 
as I said, the, it's a kind of HSM. So you cannot dump without having the, maybe the vendor's card management keys. You cannot dump the applications on the card. So I can bring my eSIM profile, which is end-to-end -end encrypted, with my malicious app, let's say, I don't know, which has the business logic of my, um, of my uh, command and control, and um, um, install it on the, as an eSIM profile. And then, um, unless, yeah, I don't know, you're at Gemalto and they give you the keys, you cannot dump it and you cannot analyze it. So that should give some problems to attackers, uh, to defenders that want to see what's going on. Um, and um, the, the EU ICCs even support proper encryption. So you can do AES on the card and um, you could encrypt and decrypt stuff on the card. So even um, uh, if you observe the host system, you cannot uh, decrypt the commands and cannot get to the keys, which is also, I guess, for defenders kind of bad, for attackers uh, probably nicer. Um, I think you can also do, it, uh, do TLS um, backed by the card. Um, and yeah, so that's good luck with forensics, I guess. I mean, of course, you can observe what happens on the host system. Yeah, but you don't know what, what are the capabilities of that thing or what data it's stolen. Huh? So, um, so make sure that you have control over the actual EU ICC security domains if you, if you can, right? So I don't know if large companies can get that from vendors. Um, but then it's, it's still not easy to get them off the card. I, it's not documented. I'm sure there's a way, but there's no official API or something to dump an application again. Um, um, yeah, that's the, the hint again. Um, so, conclusion um, of the track. So, eSIM opens a vast attack surface um, to researchers and to, to attackers, of course. Uh, but it's, it's a vast attack surface to research. Um, we found um, new applications for eSIM technology, for red teaming, uh, but also for research, using it as a research tool to, for example, find bugs in uh, mobile devices. Um, uh, there's a lot of things that are that is possible to follow in different areas, attacking the EU ICCs themselves. Uh, the protocol, as I said, it's super complex. Um, then the mobile platforms themselves, um, yeah, Windows desktop systems as we've seen, where we can find bugs. Um, um, I think I could have done three talks with different topics about that. So um, um, that's, that's, yeah, that's the thing. And that's why it makes it interesting. And I hope that others are also, uh, will also start looking into that. Um, yeah, quick thank you and some tools that um, one of them we still need to release, like the test applet and the test profile. Um, then we have actually a tool, I didn't show that today, um, which is called Multirand to try to brute force these management keys uh, from a profile, for example, or from a, even from, a, uh, from the EUICC, uh, which can be found on the X41 GitHub. And then we have the SMS shell, which is this C2 uh, POC that I just shown. I've shown um, that is, um, yeah, the SMS shell that's also available on the C GitHub. So, yes, thank you very much. Mm, are there any questions? So for your next level POC, you want to deploy two profiles, uh, one that you have control of as HSM and the other one just for the connectivity? Or? Um, uh, actually, one profile should be enough because the um, profile over the SIM toolkit API, they can, um, for example, uh, send SMS and there's also um, um, start calls and uh, there's also a BRA independent protocol, which I didn't go deep into. 
that is also a protocol to talk to some backends and to end encrypted. So I think one profile should be enough. Um, there's also only one profile can be active at the time currently. I think they want to change that, but oh, that's actually an important point. So only one eSIM profile can be activated um, at, at the time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.